us dissect this issue is uh, Professor Peter Karungu, Dr. Peter Karungu, rather, who is a senior researcher at uh, Vets University. Thank you very much for joining us on our program. Thank you. And uh, thank you to the listeners. Well, let's start first by hearing your feelings concerning what is happening in the country at the moment. Well, I think I will use economics more than anything else, but uh, I'll give you a good example. I've been teaching at Vets University since 1991. I produce some of the best economists in this country, some of whom have gotten their PhD. I also create jobs not because it's paramount but because I believe we with the capability should create jobs. I have a team of close to a hundred people. This month to pay them salaries I had to make money from Mauritius, from Ghana and from Botswana because they pay on time and therefore we export a lot. At the moment I have to revisit this country to convince them listen the South African product has not changed. It will be the same product. That gives you a snapshot of the reality on one hand of what's happening and the consequences of what can be. Because two things. One, economies worldwide are driven by two things. Expectations and realities on the ground. In other words, we expect X to happen within a certain time. And then, of course, there will be perception what are we perceiving to be? That's common adage in economics. Now, what we are watching on TV is literally very detrimental to South African economy. These are the facts. Africa has 1.13 billion people. 1.13 billion people. Of whom, South Africa, we are about 50 million. You want to factor yourself out because the image of children killed or women being whipped, not for anything else, but for where they come from, has economic consequences that is very dire. In the short term, it looks okay. In the medium term, it looks okay. But in the long term, you create that which you cannot correct. Number two, the GDP of Africa is sitting on close to 2.5 trillion US dollars. The 10 leading economies in Africa are sitting on 1.964 billion dollars. Mm -hmm. South Africa is sitting on 342 billion, which is less than 13% of African GDP. 10 years ago, when I was teaching economics, South African GDP was higher than 25% of African GDP. Today, it has fallen by half at a start of Bristol. Now, question, what are we doing and what are the consequences of our action? One, you are creating market perception that deters us from progressing at the rate Africa was projecting. It is commonly known that the emerging economy in, Af in the world today is Africa. The growth rate outside South Africa is between 5 to 80 percent. Our growth is less than 2 percent. But we were leveraging because of our capability in manufacturing, our capability in technology, we had the opportunity to grow our economy within the African continent. Already that's what mm -hmm. we are missing. Okay, let, let me come in there, Prof. Now, I'd like, I'd like to bring it closer to home because the violence that we have been seeing, uh, does it seem to you as people who are disgruntled because they find that their local economic factors are dysfunctional for them and that they're not able to make a living for themselves. Now, for them to see small businesses of foreigners thriving in their own local uh, uh, communities makes them to feel that element of jealousy, that element of feeling left out, out of the economic mainstream stream, hence the jealousy that we see. Agreed. However, if you argue an outsider came and created a market better than yours, and you are local, the way is to dialogue among yourself and among the people. Because if somebody is based in a town, let's say Kwamashu, instead of killing him, tell your locals don't buy from him. That's dialogue. Analyze issues that will protect yours. But to cut down competition is not a solution. That's number one. Number two, we've got to understand the following. Yes, there are a lot of frustration. The South African 
economy has bled the highest form of inequality. We are the most unequal society in the world. After independence, we thought that we could be able to correct this and create an environment for everybody to be able to create wealth and get rural wealth that people will be able to enjoy. And yeah, we are on yeah, the but, but, but coming in there, when you drive down to Soweto and you see all the shops that had been before, they were closed down and they have currently been taken over by foreigners. Secondly, you look at many uh, homes. They've rented out their garages to foreigners to operate shops from there. So what has muzzled out the local South Africans in terms of the cartels that have been formed by the foreigners in terms of buying in bulk? And does that warrant them to feel left out whereas they are not competing? Colin, I beg to differ for two reasons. I don't understand how negotiation of cartel can be formed by outsiders more than the people within. That is not it doesn't be an economic issue. But they're saying they're buying in bulk and but they're selling cheaper, so that's what's killing the local businesses. That's why they're fighting. The issue is our government has failed us tremendously. As early as 1998-2000, we as economists wrote to the Department of Agriculture and anybody who cared to say let's create cooperative that will create wealth in the rural areas. It's on the record. Mm. Of course, we were made to believe that, and I quote, one DG said to me, Dr. Karungu, we cannot create dependence. I said to him, the Americans do it to create wealth supporting agriculture in the rural area. That was then. And I'm not here to debate what was what was. Mm. It's to give you facts on the causes of this. Because, listen, if you look at it, no matter how big you calculate the rural, that rural business of spasa shop and who is killing who, among the owners, their turnover a year, I, I don't have the statistics. I looked for it. I couldn't find it. It is barely two billion, not even two billion. On the other hand, we know that this economy, 13 billion a year, is wasted on, on corruption. Now, we are killing each other on what we call the scrum of bread rather than facing the realities on the ground. Number two, tell me, 80% of the wealth and economy in this country belong to white people and elite black people, maybe you and I. 80%, whereby a majority of our people in dire poverty. I can understand their frustration. But we are not solving the problem. I was listening to SAFM now now. And one chorus called from South Africa. He's a South African. He said he was born in Tanzania. But the father was in exile for so many years. He said to me the following. After they clean these poor foreigners in whatever they are killing them, the next it will be you, the Kosa, and the Zulu. Because the inequality is greary. Then it will be the poor against the middle class. Then it will be the middle class against that. Mm. We need to be guided. Okay. There is no justification forward. of any form mm. of fighting anybody without dialogue for what you believe has been unfair to you but is not the cause or direct. All right. My, my, my time is up now. I want us to talk about the way forward. What is the solution? And uh, not only an interim one, a long-term solution to this problem. I think the long-term solution is, first up, I am I'm happy to report that many people want to go back. I have seen a lot of people going back. I think the inflow is much less than the outflow. The, the outflow exceeds the inflow that we have seen because the economies in Africa are booming. That's a fact. And we have been sought after a lot of people to go work there. But people are saying, let's stick around because of your investment. We need to understand that. The second aspect is to address the issue of poverty. We need a summit of top economists, prominent business people. We cannot afford to watch the CEOs of this mining earning atrocious amount of money, called bonuses, when our many people are literally living in abject poverty. Remember, the security and tenure of any economy of our children and your children is what we do now for the future generation. But we can't do that by I accumulating the wealth that we have. And finally, remember, what kills the economy is when people start saying the world is comprised of I, me, and myself, and you don't care about other people. But that's a debate for another day. That's a debate for another day, Prof. Thank you very much for so much insightful analysis on this topic. I can only listen to you more than interject and ask you a lot of questions because I believe you have a lot of info within your brain. So that's why I'm trying to pick you all the time. But thank you so much for your time, sir. I appreciate it. All right. Okay, bye.